so welcome all uh, the virtual Seed computational biology seminar series. Um, I would like uh, today to have uh, Zoltan Kutalik, who is assistant professor at the um, Division of Biostatistics of the Institute of Social and uh, Preventive Medicine at CHUV, and also a group leader at uh, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. So um, Zoltan. Uh, uh, was trained as a applied mathematician and he obtained his uh, PhD in 2006 at the School of Computing Science at the University of East Anglia and the Computational Microbiology Lab of the Food Research Institute uh, in Norwich, UK. Then from uh, 2006 to 2010, he uh, did a postdoc at the University of Lausanne in the Department of Medical Genetics. And uh, in 2011, uh, Zoltan became a junior lecturer at the same department of medical genetics. And then in 2013, as I said, he became an uh, assistant professor. Um, so his main research interest um, lies in developing statistical methods, integrating values on this data in order to better understand uh, genetic disease in the context of uh, what we call g was genome wide association studies. And, um, he has been part of many um, collaboration, international collaboration as an analyst and a principal investigator uh, on, on different, um, different uh, GWAS efforts like uh, obesity, hypertension, and other uh, traits. So uh, today, Zoltan will explain uh, to us what we can learn from analyzing uh, metadata from those uh, GWAS. So, Zoltan, the floor is yours. Thanks very much for the introduction. Also, thanks for the invitation. Uh, and also thanks for those who actually came and are just virtually looking, tracking it through a screen, although we are geeky bioinformaticians, we tend to like to watch things on screens rather than coming, but thanks a lot for coming. Uh, today I decided not to talk about, uh, not to center my talk around the research topic, but to center my talk around data type. So this data type is this, I call it metadata, I will explain to you what metadata is. And uh, in the first about 15 slides will lead up, basically set the stage for what metadata is. So, uh, instead of directly jumping on what is meta-analysis and what is uh, genome-wide association studies, I start with one simple example of one small cohort here in Lausanne, what we have in the Lausanne Hospital at Schuf, uh, where about uh, half, uh, five and a half thousand individuals have been genotyped, uh, meaning that a large part of the genome has been identified uh, through genotyping technologies. It's, it doesn't matter how. And at the same time, these people have been uh, also extensively phenotyped at hospitals. So this is really serious examinations over hours and hours. So these people are kind of heroes for us. And having this de genetic data, uh, we then run genome-wide association scans. The way we run the scans is that uh, we model the outcome trait, which is denoted by Y on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, as a function of different covariates over is typically, if we look at the phenotype being, for example, BMI, as you can see in the data column, uh, the cover is typically variables that are influencing BMI that are non-genetic factors. So this can be typically age, uh, gender, uh, diet, physical activity, and so on. So these we can all dump in here as cover is, and we can also uh, put in other genetic factors. And then there is the second term on the right-hand side of this equation, which denotes the genetic one single gene's additively coded effect which is the effect size is beta, meaning that each additional copy of a risk allele or of an allele uh, increases or decreases your outcome trait by a certain amount, and this amount is this beta g. So this is what we call the effect size. Everything else is called error, which we can't explain, or just uh, what we don't know about or we haven't measured. So that we have the model, we have the data that we obtain, for example, in our hospital, but similar data have been obtained in many other hospitals around the world. Uh, and if we just look at one data and we compare the model to our data, and we can test the hypothesis for every single SNP, whether this effect size, this beta g, is significantly different from zero. So that's the simplest model you can imagine in any sort of statistical setting. Uh, we do a hypothesis testing and we estimate this effect uh, more visually, the way it's done for every polymorphism, you can carry this example on FTO, it's an uh, exonic polymorphism in the FTO uh, gene on chromosome 16. This has the largest ever reported effect on obesity, on BMI. And 
every population has been, can be split up into three groups. Either you can carry two alleles, one allele, or zero alleles. And these three groups are then co can be compared phenotypically. So then we, on the y-axis, we see the distribution of the body mass index of these individuals into three groups. And we want to make an observation that, for example, there is a trend of increasing BMI as you have more and more a allele copies. And then you can fit a regression line. You can estimate that every copy of an A allele that you carry will increase your BMI by about 0 0.7. It's a slight overestimation. It's okay. In reality, the true value is lying more about 0 0.3. So practically, it's 0 0.3 units. So these people on the TT end versus the AA end, they differ uh, here in Colaus with more than one BMI unit. So it's, in effect, relatively small. But if you accumulate with other effects, it can be larger. We also have an estimate how much confidence we have in this. So this is marked by this, uh, this shaded area, which means that if this is very, very narrow, it means we're very, very sure about that the T effect estimate is, is, is the right one. And if this shaded area is very large around the, uh, the line, then it means that you have little confidence in the estimator. And we don't have enough statistical evidence to reject the hypothesis that actually the effect is zero and the three groups are, have identical means. Uh, then these results, so then, then these models are tested, basically these plots, you can stare at these plots a million times at four million different polymorphisms. Here I just picked one of them. And basically you can scan through the genome and for each of these plots you can assign a p-value. In the next slide you can see uh, how this, to visualize these p-values in two fashions. One is each dot is a polymorphism which is plotted according to, on the x-axis, its chromosomal location. And on the y-axis is the minus log 10 association p-value. So basically, if you have a large peak like the FTO that I just showed you, here this is a much larger study than ours. It, it found FTO being extremely strongly associated with BMI. And you see where it lies on chromosome 16. And then you can zoom in and you can even look at gene annotation and so on. So this is the one of the first plot. It looks like a Manhattan skyline. There is a baseline level of skyscrapers, and there are a couple of huge ones that are emerging in this plot. So here you see about 32 skyscrapers. The second type of plot is a quantile quantile plot. It's a bit more complicated here. You don't care about the position of this polymorphism. Here you just plot the association strength against uh, what you would expect if there were no association whatsoever. So as I mentioned, we obtain 1 million p-values, which we get for each of the 1 million SNPs. And these 1 million p-values are ordered. So the most significant in this study, for example, was 10 to minus 25. And you compare it, what would be the most significant p-value if, uh, if there were no associations in your study, which is the x-axis position of this dot, which is around 10 to the minus 6, because we are testing 1 million variants. So if you see a deviation on this quantile one type plot from the line, it shows that the distribution of your p-values that you observed in your study significantly differs from the uniform distribution, and you have more significant findings that you would uh, just see uh, by chance in a completely arbitrary trait. So now this is a cumulative Manhattan plot over all the studies. So here you can see how the time changes. And here you see the old GBA studies that have ever been published in the literature in the past uh, 10 years, roughly. So you see that after a while, you can't see anything. And that's the point of the whole graph. Is uh, that initially there were very few studies, and there was a big boom around 2008 when everybody started to conduct these studies, and it became really, really cheap. It cost about 100 francs now to, to have one individual genotype. So what you know, the bigger cost is on the hospitals where they have, to, they have to phenotype these individuals. You see a major peak on chromosome 6 on the HLA region, uh, and otherwise you see that there are pits everywhere, all over the genome. Every particular segment of the genome is now associated with some trait. So basically, if it keeps going on, if I show the same slide in 10 years or five years, you, you won't see even this. This is actually color coded according to different trait groups. So if you look at this graph, uh, the previous one, then it's very successful. So we find many, many variants. These studies in the past 10 years have, have, have discovered enormous number of genetic associations. He, if you look at one particular one on body mass index, as, as I mentioned, I'm interested in obesity. Uh, body mass index in the latest study, which was published two months ago, it has found about 100 genome-wide significant loci. Uh, you see here about 100 red dots. So this is typical Manhattan plot, very successful study. But the downside or the other side of the coin is that even cumulatively, if you take these 100 together, 
they explain not even 3% of the variability of BMI of a population. So they don't explain much. We can learn a lot about biology, but you can see that the top one here, which is uh, the FTU variant, it explains one third of a percent. Extremely tiny, so it, it, it's, uh, it roughly translates into 0.34 BMI unit difference of people who carry more risk areas. And you can see that initially it grows quite well, but then it starts to plateau, and from around 50 number of loci up to 100, the effect seems to stagnate, they seem to be the same, and maybe if you continue even longer, it starts to really flatten out, meaning that every additional dis discovery explains very, very much, very, very small additional uh, variance of the phenotype. You can look at it more positively. You can look at the next slide, the, the number, the basically grouping the individuals into how many risk alleles they carry. So this is the very unfortunate group on the right-hand side of the right extreme who carry more than 104 risk alleles. These people, uh, of course, it's just a tiny fraction of the whole population, a few percent, but they have an average BMI of 30 and a half. But if you look at the other ones, who are the rather fortunate ones, they have less than 78 risk alleles. Uh, their BMI is about 27 and a half, so there's four units of BMI difference depending on how many risk alleles you carry. And this is already defined at birth, so if you look at the positive side, already at birth you can uh, come up, basically, this means 104 risk variants it's, is that on average you are heterozygous for each of these 100 discovered SNPs. And already this makes your BMI increase by practically two units compared to the population average. So we can actually tell something about at least a subgroup of the population. So it's typically like if you look at the rare variant, the rare variants have also a large effect, and they define a very small group which is who are at risk. This is the same that you have many common variants that also defines a small risk group which are at high risk of obesity. Okay, so this was uh, how, what I wanted to say in general about genome-wide association studies. These studies are typically conducted in hundreds of thousands of individuals, discover very tiny effects, and we have, the way they are conducted is basically the data type, what I'm going to talk about is this metadata. This comes from these studies. In each individual study provides us uh, effect size estimate, sample size allele frequency for each polymorphism, a standard error of this effect size, the p-value, the quality of the SNP, so you can have some SNPs which you inferred which, or which you have measured but with poor quality, we can quantify this, and also uh, they can provide us the phenotypic variance in each genotype group. So these typical statistics are available for a large number of cohorts, and they have not, haven't been used for anything else apart from looking at the p-value and say, okay, hey, this is a significant p-value, it's a new discovery, let's publish it. But all the rest has been largely ignored. So what I will talk to you about is how you can recycle this data, how you can look at these kind of values in a, uh, dozens of cohorts, and what we can learn from it. So I will structure my talk around these five different things you can do with these statistics. For example, the first one is if you have uh, two SNPs that are associated with a trait, for example, obesity, uh, what you can do on top of this, from, from this data and from external data, is that you can calculate the cumulative effect of these two SNPs, basically a multivariate model instead of a uni univariate model, without going back to the cohorts and asking them to redo this analysis, but you can centrally do this already with the available univariate data. So this is to detect allelic heterogeneity, meaning multiple independent or semi-independent SNPs in the same genetic locus or in the same gene influencing the same phenotype. So this is topic number one. Number two is imputation. So practically if you have the same two SNPs uh, associated with obesity, but you can ask a question about another SNP which has not been part of any of these studies, and you are asking, is this other SNP, uh, what is its association with obesity, knowing that you have many other SNPs for which you know the association, but not for this one. This is called, uh, this is done due through imputation. The third topic is gene gene interactions. So by knowing the association of these two SNPs, can we tell something about their interaction? Do they interact with each other, uh, influencing the phenotype? Uh, this is the third. The fourth topic is, can we learn something about the parent of origin effects? So we know that you, if you carry, for example, an A allele, it may increase your obesity. But the question is that if you carry an A allele, that was inherited, or for example, an A allele, which was inherited from your father, like in this case, maybe your BMI is different from the scenario where the 
the B allele, sorry, the, the T allele was inherited, the A allele was inherited from the mother. So these two individuals, they have the exact same genotype, but they inherited their alleles from different parents. One is from maternal, the other is from paternal. Does it make a difference for the outcome measure, for example, for obesity? And we can answer also this question without knowing anything about the parents. That's the beauty of it. And the final topic is uh, inferring other things than just simple associations. We can also, if we have a list of SNPs that are associated uh, with obesity, what we can ask is, are people, do people tend to uh, find mates or have the, do they, are they more similar to their partners with respect to this set of SNPs? Meaning, do you find your mating partner based on the genotype of this person? So I will tell you more about it when we get there. But this is something which was uh, it's quite a recent work and is still in progress. So, uh, so these are the five topics. Uh, in the so the next about half an hour, I will cover these these five or as many as I, I can. So allylic heterogeneity I first came across with when I collaborated with Madhu Tafti, who is uh, working in this building. And we were looking at uh, genetic markers that predispose you to narcolepsy. So narcolepsy is sleep disorder, practically. Uh, you can fall asleep any time of the day, anywhere, without uh, uh, being tired or be without having any problem. Uh, the, the major discovery which has been done uh, several decades ago is that uh, the, on, in the HLA region, the DGB1602 haplotype, you don't need to know what it is, but there's a haplotype which predisposes you to narcolepsy. However, quarter of us, so one quarter of all of us in this room carry this haplotype and still doesn't have narcolepsy. So the question was, what, what is there in our genome or somewhere else which, which protects us from narcolepsy? And uh, when we ran the research, we scanned the whole genome and we didn't find anything. So then we decided that, okay, let's look again at the HLA locus itself, because that's everybody ignored, because yeah, we know the HLA, there is the DQB1, you don't need to look there. So we looked at the same region, and we found actually that there are several other alleles, most importantly the O6, O3 allele, so the last but one highlighted line in this table, is a protective one. So it roughly decreases your chance to be narcoleptic by five-fold if you carry this uh, HLA DQB1 allele uh, on top of your uh, 602 allele. So practically you have a risk allele, but you carry an other additional allele on your other chromosome, and this other allele is actually saving you from developing narcolepsy. Uh, so this is the same locus, there was a second signal, which was actually protective on top of the first risk signal. The second experience that I had with uh, allylic heterogeneity was uh, in carbide efficient transferring genes. So this is a complicated term. What it's used for, it's an alcohol marker. So practically, if, if they measure this value for you, they can tell you whether you have a long term of alcohol abuse, uh, practically telling you whether you're alcoholic or not. And you can associate this level with uh, the different genotypes in the genome. And our most significant association in the whole genome was falling into an SRPRB gene, which didn't tell us anything. But it was just lying next to a gene which is called transferring, which makes a lot of sense because it's in the end, it's some sort of glycosylated transferring. So, but we, were, we didn't really understand why the signal is not in this gene, but somewhere else nearby. And then what we did is we did a stepwise model selection where we tried to find the best predictors which are in this region that would describe best the association uh, of this variant or actually the association of this region with the, the levels of the CDT. What we found uh, actually that it gave us directly a model of three SNPs in the, during the step by selection the original SNP was dropped and three new SNPs came up as these three explain best the association with CDT levels. So meaning that this SNP was just tagged by a linear combination of this three ones that are highlighted in green, and these are all non-synonymous changes in the transferring gene, which makes us very confident that this actually has a real meaning, and actually these three explain more than 50% more variance of the CDT variability than the topic which was found earlier. So there are many examples in the literature, and luckily some I was involved in, where actually really there are different independent contributions of variant lying nearby to each other or even in the same gene <coughs> that contribute to a trait. So that's why we came up with a method which can use genome-wide, uh, so this metadata, practically here, this is the effect size, the univariate effect size which is reported by each study, plus uses uh, a correlation matrix, which is just a snip-by-snip -snip correlation matrix in the region, which you can easily get from anywhere. There are many public data available from which you can estimate 
correlations between SNPs. And this formula, just based on these two quantities, the M and M are very simple. The M is the number of markers in the region. The N is the sample size from which you, uh, you gathered your data from. So typically, this is large mathematic GWAS studies with where the sample size is about hundreds of thousands and hundreds of thousands. Uh, and this formula gives an estimator of how much variance is explained by this locus. And also, it gives you an estimate how does this SNP look like uh, or what can be the causal SNP. So when we apply it to, uh, to real data on height, we found many, many very interesting loci. This was probably one of the most exciting ones because it has been now rediscovered by the recent uh, Nature Genetics paper on height, which, which is the most sort of polymorphic, most allelic heterogeneous locus, where in the same gene, if you only look at the top hit and its LD partners, you only see some intronic associations. But if you look at this multivariate uh, analysis, then it discovers many non-synonymous and synonymous changes which are associated with height in this gene. And there are novel sequencing studies that have shown uh, even more of these non-coding part of the gene uh, being very important. So let's now switch to summer statistic imputation. So as I mentioned to you, uh, this is the nightmare of, uh, of a GVAS analyst when you, there is a causal variant which is marked with red on this dot but you don't measure many, many of the variants in the region, and you just measure these blue ones. And you want somehow infer what would be the association of other variants uh, if you had uh, data on them. But obviously you don't have, but what you have is external data of sequenced individuals. So you use a large set of population panel, like the thousand genome panel, from which you can infer correlations between SNPs uh, that are available just without any phenotypes. So th this is a large sample and is sequenced, but you don't have any phenotypes for them. What you have is extremely large number of cohort data where you have genotypes, but only measured for a small pro proportion of SNPs. So typically, in GWAS, we measure half a million, million SNPs. Uh, sequencing studies, obviously, they discover tens of millions of variants. We would like to know what would happen if uh, this, this, each of all our studies have been sequenced. Of course, it costs a lot of money, so we can't do it. So for this, what we run is an imputation where we infer our cohort, what kind of haplotype mosaics would give rise to our actual individuals, and this way you can fill in the missing information. Okay, so this is some trick. You can apply it to data, and what you see is that you will get many, many rare variants, uh, and many of these rare variants actually terribly imputed. So you impute them, so you somehow you guess them in your cohort, but with a terrible accuracy. So for about only 6% of these very rare ones, it's, it's about 23 million rare polymorphisms that you can impute in your cohort, but only 6% of them are actually useful for you. All the rest is just noise. noise. Uh, and in general, this is the, on the right-hand side, this is the plot of the distribution of the imputation quality. And here you see that these ones about, about 0 0.7, they represent about a quarter of the markers that we imputed, and all the rest is quite useless. All the rest of the 75% of the data that we imputed are useless. But still, it still gives many, many more million, millions of markers that are very important and, and we can very accurately impute. If you are lazy, uh, you can do something simpler. So what I described to you before was that you have to your data and several SNPs, like the third SNP, uh, here is not measured. So it, th th that's why there are the question marks. And then you use reference sequence data, and from the sequence data you can impute them in a probabilistic fashion. And then you can run your association study, and then you have now new associations for a much denser set of markers, so typically as if you had sequence data, partly. But if you're lazy, you can actually don't care about imputing your genotype data itself, but you directly start with association summer statistics. So you have here the effect size of each of your measured SNPs in your cohort, and you use now the reference database uh, to impute directly the association summary statistics and not caring about imputing the genotype. Why do we do this? Because it's much, much faster, much easier, and doesn't take much memory. So this is typically the, the lazy people's uh, solution to this, and we are quite lazy in our lab. So what we uh, came up with is that there's a fairly simple formula that can estimate if this is the red variant in the middle, which you want to impute, and you know the association results for these crosses, uh, then simply by knowing the correlation between these measured markers, 
between themselves. If you know the association summary statistics, so practically you have the association results for the crosses, uh, then you can calculate what would be the association statistic for the unmeasured red variant. So it's all great. We can apply it to data. You can even make it more complicated in the sense that for each cohort, you can use a different reference population to, to impute the summary statistics and then meta-analyze it together. But the bottom line is, is that typically what we find for human height is that there are several dozens of loci where if you look at the less denser, so this is the head map, is the red ones, the red dots here are the original uh, genotypes. And you see an association clearly. But if you look not much denser at the thousand genome, basically as if you had sequenced them, we can impute it and we see now new variants appearing with much more, uh, much stronger association uh, uh, effect sizes. And these are probably the ones that have been tagged by the, some of the red ones that are the top hits. But now we discover what is actually the causal variant. We managed to find map what individual variants, and which are much rarer often, are driving this association signal and what are the causal ones and what are just the consequences which are just tagging. Okay, so now it's changing interaction. This is a, a topic which is either most people are, don't care about it and don't believe in it, or people become obsessed about it and they try to, at all costs, find ginger interactions, which is an extremely difficult topic. But if you find some, usually you publish it in Nature. So it's a, either you get into Madhouse or you publish it in Nature. So it's really a thin line between the two. Uh, that has been done, for example, with gene expression. You, people have found uh, a few associations and they published it uh, late last year. So in the basic setup, we have our outcome trait, which is Y, and we model it with the genotype. In this case, it's like G by F. I put it in F here. And alpha was the effect size, how much this gene has an effect on the outcome trait. In an interaction study, you have two, two SNPs, so SNP F and SNP G. And you also have the interaction of the two SNPs, which is H. So the, simply, if you multiply element by element this genotype, uh, then you get this H. But I guess you don't care about formula that much. What you can visualize it very simply is that if you look at two SNPs, so one is called RS9747, blah, blah, and the other is RS155, and so on. This was still the FTO step that you've seen on the first slide. If you now split your population into three subgroups, those who carry this first SNP uh, in an AA allele, those who carry the first SNP and the heterozygous for it, and the last ones who are homozygous GG for this uh, RS9747 SNP. And if in these three subgroups, now you run an association study with the second SNP, and if you see that, for example, in the first plot on the left side, you see there's a negative trend. The more ALAs you carry for the second SNP, the lower your BMI will be, but only in the AEA group for the first SNP. In the middle group, in the middle panel, you see no association. Doesn't matter how many ALAs you carry, you have flat all the same BMI. And in the final plot, uh, the more ALAs you carry, the higher your BMI is. Of course, I just made up this data. It doesn't exist in reality because it's too beautiful to be true. But the point is that this is a typical interaction between this step, the first and the second step. Meaning that if you stratify your samples according to the genotypes of the first step, then the associations, basically the slopes uh, which show your association with the second SNP and the, your outcome trait, which is BMI in this case, uh, the slopes will be different. And this is the change in interaction or SNP SNP interactions. So in this case, the first SNP is interacting with the second SNP. So this is an extreme scenario because most of the cohorts won't provide this data, especially if they would provide such data that would be uh, a million times million uh, effect size and so on. And it's, it's just too much to, to share and to upload and to download and so on. So it's, it's not feasible. But what cohorts provide is, uh, what you can look at it is, this is an extreme scenario of an association in a subgroup with 0% GLU frequency for the first name. And the, the right-hand side panel is an association in a subgroup where the GLU frequency is 100%. Now, what if we have a population where the GLA frequency is 10% and another population where the GLA frequency is 30%. So the population which has less GLA frequency, we expect that the slope be less or more negative compared to another cohort where the GLA frequency is higher. So what we'll do is simply, I directly jump to this slide actually. 
what we do is we look at the L frequency of each cohort. So here each dot is a cohort, and the size of the circle is proportional to the size of the cohort. And what we want to see is if there is an interaction between the first SNP and the second SNP, then what we want to see is that there is a slope uh, with the, when you regress the, the sorry, when you regress the beta, so basically the effect size of the second SNP, onto the allele frequency of the first SNP. Okay, so there's a trick here. The higher the L frequency of the second SNP, in this case, the lower the effect of the, sorry, I call the second, let's say, the higher the L frequency of the first SNP, the lower the effect size of the second SNP. And if you find such associations where the L frequency of one SNP is very well correlated with the effect size of the second SNP, that means actually an interaction between the two SNPs. And that trick we can actually use because this here, each of them, is a contributing study to our giant consortium. So if you have enough studies, you can actually gather quite strong evidence for such interactions. And you don't need to go back to the cohorts. That's the beauty. You only need, so in the formula, uh, you can estimate the interaction effect by just knowing the simple marginal associations, which are the betas and the standard errors, and knowing the LA frequency of the second state. So just by knowing L frequency genome-wide and knowing uh, effect size genome-wide can help you to estimate the interaction between the two variants. However, there's some downside. Obviously, if you have a SNP whose L frequency, so in this case, for this SNP, the L frequency, you're very lucky. It varied a lot from 23, 20, even 20%, up to 47%. So you must have a broad variability in the L frequency, otherwise, uh, you wouldn't be able to see such correlation between LA frequency and the effect size of another SNP. So typically, this test has to be done only for SNPs which have a, a variable LA frequency across our cohorts. So typically, these are the SNPs that have a, a high FST value. So FST is if the frequency of the SNP is very different across different European populations, then this SNP is a good candidate for testing it as an interaction. So in our case, we had 300,000 samples, but the actual effective sample size is 300,000 times this FST value, which is typically between, uh, it's, it's extremely low, like 0.1% and 2-3%. So, although you have 300,000 samples, it's roughly equivalent to just having 10,000 samples with actual genetic data where you do the test and you run the test in your actual cohort. And actually, that's why it's not very appealing often except for a few hundred SNPs where you have actually more power than a very large study. Uh, so there's a downside to it, and, uh, and so far we, we are replicating the uh, uh, outcoming association, but we are not sure whether anything will survive. Uh, the parent of origin effects, very briefly, is when the alleles you inherited, we are typically looking at heterozygous individuals, the heterozygous individuals are distributed into two groups. One is who got the a allele from the mother, and the other is the A allele from the father. And these two groups may have distinct phenotypes. And the reason for this is that uh, some of the groups, for example, what you inherited from your mother, it may have, it may be methylated, meaning that there might be a methyl group attached to your DNA, and this methyl group attracts many different molecules which eventually shut down the expression of this. So this uh, genomic imprinting uh, is achieved by this monoallelic uh, regulation of the gene expression and shutting down one of the expressions of the gene and that's why it makes a difference whether you have a methyl group or not because if you don't have the methyl group your the expression will not be not be shut down if you have the methyl group you have a high chance that the, it, the region will be methylated and whatever variants you have in this region will have no effect so that's why it, it matters where you got the allele from the mother or from the father so that's why we looked at uh, in our cohorts, what can we say about it? I skip now one slide because we can directly go to look at the distributions of an outcome trait. So imagine this is BMI, and we have four genotype groups now. So we have those who carry two A alleles, those who have A, B heterozygous, but they got the B paternally, and those who got the B alleles maternally, and the fourth group is the usual homozygous BB. So we have four groups instead of three groups if we knew where the alleles are coming from. So the distribution of these four groups are depicted here. So you see that the, the green one, the green curve and the blue curves are 
have vastly different mean values, meaning that probably there is some uh, parent of origin effect going on, because those who paternally inherited the BLE have a much higher phenotype than those who maternally inherited the BLE. And the way to, to detect such effect in our cohort, where we don't know who is heterozygous AB maternal, AB paternal, what we can look at is still the distribution of the heterozygous group must be wider. So the phenotype distribution is now increased compared to the homozygous group. The reason for this is that the heterozygous group is made up of two heterogeneous subgroups. These two subgroups have distinct mean values, and that's why the composite distribution has a wider variability. And that's why we want to, that's how we're going to pick it up. So we don't need the parents' information. It's enough if the heterozygous group has a larger phenotypic variance. That's what we were particularly testing. Actually, we were lucky enough, we found two examples. One of them is lying, actually, was our top hit in our, we can scan it, of course, genome wide. And we found one in the KCNK, near the KCNK9 gene on chromosome 8, which was uh, one of the major, uh, this is if you look at only methylated regions. This is the KCNK9 major discovery where we see opposite effects on maternal and paternally when you inherit the same allele. And the effect size is, is fairly large. So we, when we replicated that in family studies, what we've seen is the effect is roughly comparable to the effect of FTO, which was the largest discovered genetic effect. But the, allele, the effects are going opposite direction depending on which parent you got it. And we, then we looked at the gene expressions, and gene expression shows similar pattern of opposite maternal, paternal effects. So we discovered two new SNPs, basically, that are contributing BMI, depending on from which parent you got the L from. Uh, I showed that five different uh, research questions can be asked from uh, such large forward informations. And you have only summary statistics and no actual individual data, for, uh, but for large numbers of cohorts. And uh, I hope I managed to convince to you that actually it's worth recycling large available genetic data and genome association data to answer very different questions from what was originally asked for, but why they were generated for. So I would like to thank for basically the giant consortium and also Kolaus. Uh, summer statistics invitation was in, uh, done in collaboration with them uh, from UCLA. Uh, the parent vision effect was uh, from Imperial College here in Lausanne. And now we are doing the same with my postdoc on current origin effect of gene expression, and also the heterogeneity is a, it's a bit older study, uh, which was done also in collaboration with uh, GSK and University of Germany. Thanks very much for your attention.